Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is U.S. Army veteran Vern Pike. Mr. Pike not only served during the Cold War and Vietnam, but is directly connected to some of the most indelible moments of our standoff with Soviet communism. And Mr. Pike, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, sir. Where were you born and raised, sir? Born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Raised in three places, Fort Wayne, Indiana, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Bloomfield, New Jersey. Fantastic. Uh, when did you join the service? Uh, September 1958. And were you drafted or did no, you? No, no. I was a, a commissioned as a lieutenant from ROTC. And from where? Wake Forest University. Okay. What did you major in? Soviet history. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, when you, once you joined, uh, where did you train? Uh, took officer basic at uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, in the military police school. Mm -hmm. And what were your assignments once you finished training? Oh, Lord. Uh, well, my first assignment was to, uh, was to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, I was supposed to stay in the Army for six and a half months active duty and seven and a half years reserve. And I'd been accepted to law school. And uh, I had the good fortune to marry the gal that I was engaged to while she was still in college and I was a young lieutenant. And uh, so my colonel suggested uh, I ought to consider staying in the Army now that I had some responsibilities. And he was right. So I decided to stay in the Army and uh, got assigned to Berlin, 1959. And that's where a lot of what we're going to talk about uh, uh, happened. So 1959. Uh, set the stage uh, for those who don't know about the division of the city and so forth and, and where you were stationed. The end of World War II, the victorious allies uh, divided in Germany into four zones of occupation. The Soviet zone, American, British, and French zones. 1956, the Western allies ceded their occupation duties and created the new Bundesrepublik, the Federal Republic of Germany and the Soviets created the communist uh, government of the German Democratic Republic. In the Soviet zone of occupation was the capital of Berlin, which was 110 miles to the east of the boundary separating the western zones from the, from the Soviet zone. And the city was divided into four sectors, Soviet, French, British, and American. And our function and responsibilities were to provide law enforcement and security for the American sector of Berlin and to operate the, the highway control points from West Germany to Berlin. There was one highway that we were allowed to use. So we had a checkpoint Alpha in West Germany and a checkpoint Bravo in Berlin. <coughs> Excuse me, the, the first two years of my duty in, in Berlin, uh, as a military police duty officer, your, your responsibilities included the operation of, the, of, the, of those two checkpoints. Explain checkpoint Charlie. Th that, uh, that happened uh, shortly after the 13th of August of 1961. Uh, the communists in the uh, Soviet sector of Berlin were faced with, with a real dilemma because they had a famine that particular year. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to seek freedom and you got to Berlin, just walk across the street. And what was happening in June, July, and August of 61 is literally tens of thousands of East Germans were seeking freedom. And they overloaded Marienfelder Refugee Center in the American sector of Berlin, where they would come and would be flown out to West Germany to start a new life. And we're talking about uh, the fleeing of doctors, lawyers, engineers, uh, bankers, uh, salespeople, uh, craftsmen. And to stop that flow, uh, they took the dramatic step of creating this barricade. The first barricade was not a wall, it was barbed wire. And that went up on the Saturday night, the uh, 13th of August of 61. And I happened to be military police duty officer when I got a call from one of our patrol vehicles to, uh, you better come down here to Friedrichstrasse because there's something strange going on in the Soviet sector that might impact us. So I went down there and I saw that they were digging post holes in the street of Zimmerstrasse, which was right on the border, putting cement posts in and tying them together with barbed wire. And of course, the next day, we found out they were doing it throughout the entire city. Uh, we then established a control point uh, because that was the only access point that uh, the communist authorities would allow foreign vehicles and allied vehicles to, to process through to go into the Soviet sector. 
And that became Checkpoint Charlie, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. Now, for a lot of the summer, from what I've read, you thought you would have it a fairly relaxed time. You were mainly worried about a golf course, right? <laughs> you know, the, the politics gets into the military, too. We had a new commanding general that came in who was an avid golfer. And I made the mistake of putting on my officer record for him that I'd played golf in college. And so the personnel officer is going through all the files of officers, bingo, out pops Pike, and I wind up as the club officer at the golf course to get the place squared away because the general wanted it to be a you know, first-class operation. And I was out there working, and the caddies all came over from East Germany. They slipped through the, the fence that surrounded, you know, Berlin was surrounded by East Germany. Mm -hmm. And there was a wall around that as well. Oh. It wasn't just Berlin, it was the, it was the Soviet zone of occupation. Okay. And they told me that they would probably not be able to get through much longer because there were these restrictions being placed on them. So when the caddies stopped coming, uh, we knew something was up and sure enough, I was still doing MP duty officer work. So the, that Saturday night I was the MP duty officer and the rest, as they say, is history. When did you actually notice the wall going up? I mean, you saw that we talked about the post and the barbed wire, but when they actually started pouring concrete and... Uh, well, what they were, uh, the first wall was uh, cinder blocks. And uh, that, that was, uh, I can remember they, they had these engineers over there at, by Checkpoint Charlie replacing the bar bar with these cinder blocks. And this worker looks over and I'm as far away from them as you and I are. I mean, because here's the political boundary and there was the wall. And he looks over at me in Germany and he says, Leutnant, Leutnant, warum warten Sie? Ich, ich arbeite so langsam. What are you waiting for? I'm just working as slow as I can. <laughs> And behind him is the Volkspolizei, the, the, the people's police. And he looks to the left and to the right. He's got this machine pistol and he says, Lieutenant, my machine pistol's empty. There's no ammo. What are you waiting for? That was around the 1st of September. So that was the, uh, th that's what it was all about in the very beginning. From barbed wire to, to cinder blocks and then later generations, they began the the serious wall. Let's go to October of 1961 because you were uh, in, engaged in a moment that literally could have been the beginning of a third world war. Explain where you were and what happened. I was on duty at Checkpoint Charlie and we had had a uh, series of incidents. Uh, General Clay was uh, President County's personal rep in Berlin and he had been the, the hero of the Berlin Airlift and he knew how far we could go with the Russians. Uh, the East Germans, uh, the communists, decided that they wanted to uh, force the Allies to produce identification documents to them, the, the East Germans, and we refused because we only dealt with our Soviet counterparts. And General Clay said, uh, if they stop a vehicle the next time, this is what you're gonna do. Well, they stopped a vehicle. Our Provo Marshal, Colonel Sabalik, and I, his translator, walked over to the east and confronted the, Soviet, the, the communist policeman, the Volkspolizei, and said, you know, knock it off. We don't deal with you, we deal only with the Russians. And if you keep this up, there's gonna be trouble. Came back, sent a vehicle over, they stopped it. So we then put together our military police alert squad, a squad of 12 soldiers in three Jeeps to escort a U.S civilian vehicle with U.S. Forces plates and uniformed people inside. And we were going to forcibly work our way into the east, an armed escort. The rules of engagement were very interesting. I told my 18-year-old draftees, that's what they were, young and young soldiers, you were the first unit to get the M14 rifle. You'll have a magazine in the weapon, a round in the chamber, safety off, bayonet unshielded, anyone tries to stop you, shoot them. Those were the rules of engagement in 1961. We did that 14 times. On the, the Friday afternoon, four o'clock, I'm at Checkpoint Charlie and F Company 40th Armor uh, had a platoon of tanks that was at Templehof Air Base. And they would come down as a show of force, psychological warfare, they'd stay a couple of hours and go back. They Two of the tanks had just gone back 
were on the way back to Templehof, and Major Tyree was the company commander. He was down there, and he and I were in, smoking a cigarette in the little drugstore, which was on the corner of, of Zimmer and Friedrichstrasse, and we looked down Friedrichstrasse, there's a bunch of tanks coming our way. He's, good Lord, he said, Vern, get my tanks back here. So I, afternoon rush hour in Berlin, 4.30, I head back towards Templehof, and as I get up to Templehof, the platoon of tanks were just turning into Templehof, and uh, Captain uh, Bob Lanfear was in the, in the lead tank. And I said, Bob, we got trouble at Checkpoint Charlie. Follow me back. And he goes, whoopee. And we <laughs> turn the tanks around, and we head back to Friedrichstrasse. By now, my boss, the Provo Marshal, is at Checkpoint Charlie, and he's talking to General Clay on the phone. And sure enough, those tanks are, I mean, they're, they're now there in position. And our platoon was in position. General Clay said, are they Soviet? Uh, 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 whose tanks are they? We don't know. What are they? There are T-54 tanks. That much we know. Are they Soviet or East German? The colonel says, we don't know because they painted over all the bumper markings and all their uniforms had insignia of rank taken off. They had black leather jackets with black Soviet tanker uh, leather caps. And General Clay said, you find out because if they're East German tanks, we go to war. So Colonel Sabalik turned me and says, Vern, take my driver and go over there and find out whether they're Soviet or East German tanks. Yes, sir. So we get in the sedan, we drive over, pull around back behind the formation. I want to say there were 11 tanks. There were two column of fives and then there was one up front. And I pulled in behind the last tanks and got out and there was nobody around. There were no Vopos, there were no Soviets. And I walked around the tank, and sure enough, they painted over the bumper markings. Now I'm a 25-year-old lieutenant, and my orders are to find out whose tanks they are. So I climbed up in the tank, went down inside, acrylic script on the instrument panel, that's Russian. The driver was handy enough to leave a Red Army newspaper. So I grabbed the newspaper, climbed back out of the turret, and as I'm jumping down, I see a whole bunch of soldiers up behind the lead tank, obviously getting a briefing. So Specialist McCart was the driver. I says, McCart, let's go, to, let's go to the briefing. We'll hear him talking, and then we'll know. So we go up behind them. There's about 50 of them there. And I, I don't know what his rank was. He obviously was the leader, was, was obviously an officer, and he's speaking Russian. And he looks up, and he sees these two American MPs. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't speak that much Russian, just enough to get along, but I don't know what he said, but I said, McCart, let's get the hell out of here. So we got in the car, went back to Checkpoint Charlie, and my colonel said, whose tanks are they? I said, they're Soviet, sir. So I told him, he said, you did what? And I said, sir, you told me to find out who, here's the Red Army newspaper, they're Soviet. <laughs> he says, here, you tell General Clay. So I, sir, Lieutenant Pike, they're Soviet tanks, and I told the general whose tanks they were. It must have been two or three seconds, but to me it was like an hour and a half pause. <laughs> and he said, thank you, Lieutenant, let me talk to your colonel again. The significance of that exchange was that Clay forced the Soviets to finally recognize that they were responsible for the security of their sector like we were ours, and not the, not the uh, Volkspolizei. Uh, that, was a, that was an exciting time. <laughs> to no, more, say, no more problems after that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We had a lot of, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of problems with our Soviet allies. What, what, what are you thinking? What's going through your mind when somebody tells you this could be the start of a new war if it's an East German tank? As you're heading over there, getting ready to investigate, what are you thinking? I've been asked that question a lot of times, and my honest response to you is that I was more concerned about my duty to do what I was told to do, and the implications of what we were about to do really didn't register with me. My task was to my task was to identify those tanks. We knew they were T-54s, but I had, to, I had to tell my colonel that they were Soviet tanks or East German tanks, mm -hmm. and that was my focus. And you mentioned that there were some more skirmishes. I know one was literally a tug of war over someone trying to leave East Berlin. We had a, I was up, uh, we had a uh, observation post in the, in the top floor of this apartment building that was in the corner of Zimmerstrasse and Friedrichstrasse. 
And I was, unfortunately, maybe fortunately, but I was up there in the observation post with my soldiers. And there was an individual who was, was a, a, a teacher in an East Berlin high school. And he'd gotten a, uh, an old World War II Ike jacket with corporal stripes on it, eighth Air Force patch. And he took two pieces of brass discs and with a nail he etched US in them and attached them to his collar. And he's walking down Friedrichstrasse and he's saluting the Vopos and they're saluting back. And he gets to this white line, which was the political boundary between Berlin Mitte and Berlin Kreuzberg, and he collapsed. Well, these two Vopos run over and they, ah, he's trying to flee, so they grab him by the feet to pull him back into East Berlin. And I had two MPs that were right there on the white line, just, you know, standing there doing, and they grab him by the shoulders and they got a tug of war going on. And my, my sergeant, John Dudek, comes out of the checkpoint building and runs up there, takes out his MP billy club, and he bops the two Vopos over the head. They go, ouch, and the two MPs haul this guy into West Berlin, and we turned him over to the Berlin police. But I was, all I could do was watch my soldiers. They, they were magnificent. That's amazing. So did he get to stay in the West? Oh, I assume so, because they, we turned him over to the Berlin police, and they, they sent him immediately to, I'm sure, Marienfeld Refugee Center. You must have had quite a few conversations with those guys after that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's, uh, uh, I've, I put them in for a medal. <laughs> <laughs> they, they did not get the medal. <laughs> uh, and then in February of 1962, yes. uh, you have another interesting moment at a place that's gotten much more famous now because of a, yeah. of a movie. Bridge of Spies. Yeah. Yeah. Four o'clock on, a, on a, again, a Friday afternoon, Colonel Sabalik calls me into his office. And he said, Vern, I want all the Germans out of the Provo Marshal Office, MP station. The German civilian workers, secretaries, whatnot, uh, German police, he went out. Uh, we finally, about quarter to five, got them out. You don't tell a German to leave an hour and a half early. I mean, they, <laughs> their, their work environment is... They finally got them out, and three civilians came in and uh, went downstairs into our detention cell area. And one of them was put in the detention cell, and two others were sitting outside the entire night. The next morning at 8.30, I get a call. <clears throat> I, was, I was duty officer that day. And uh, Colonel Sabalik says, Vern, take me to Alpha 10, which was the Freedom Bridge. Uh, we got to Alpha 10, and he said, all those border policemen, West Berlin border policemen, put them in the guard shack on the floor so they can't look out, which I did. And in about 20 minutes, a, there was a telephone in the guard shack. My sergeant at Checkpoint Charlie, I, I knew nothing about this, but I'm, he, sir, this is Sergeant Clint, we, I, I've forgotten his name, but we, he said, uh, the student has been released. So I motioned to Colonel Sabalik, and I, I did this. And the three people get out of the Provo Marshal's car and they walk out to the middle of the bridge. And three people came from the Soviet side and walked out to the middle of the bridge, exchanged the two in the middle. The three came back, got in Colonel Sabalik's car, and he says, take me to Tempelhof ASAP. Morning rush hour now. Oh, it's about 20 miles from the Freedom Bridge to Tempelhof, the other side of Berlin. So we finally get to Tempelhof Air Base. And the, it's like a hangar, you know, there's an overhang at Tempelhof and the airplane is underneath that. And the propellers are turning and these three guys go running up the steps and my colonel says, you know who that is? I said, no sir, he says, that's Gary Powers. <laughs> we had Colonel Abel as a guest in our hotel that previous evening. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, it was a magnificent operation. No one in Berlin, in the military chain of command or the diplomatic chain of command, knew anything about that operation. It was incredible. It was perfect. Nobody knew anything about it. Clean exchange in here except, right there. Except my colonel, the, the provo marshal. <laughs> and apparently he got the call from the CIA station chief. You know, it's Bob and Sid, they were good. And uh, that's what happened. It was, it was quite an operation. It's amazing. Yes. And Powers, of course, was the famous U-2 pilot who was yes, sir. Uh, shot down over yep. the Soviet Union. Um, 
When did you, how long did you stay in Berlin then? Uh, I stayed until October of 1962. Mm -hmm. uh, came back to the States, resigned my commission, got out of the Army, and uh, worked, uh, I went into the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, my wife and I woke up one morning and said, you know, all the things that we thought we didn't like about the military, we find the same thing out here. So we enjoyed what we were doing in the military. So I requested recall to active duty. Uh, the October Cuban Missile Crisis had just finished up. And uh, I went back on active duty and stayed for 30 years. Wow. When did you go to Vietnam? My first time was 1965-66. Uh, I was a company commander. Uh, I had uh, MPs in 14 locations in Vietnam. We were outside of Saigon. We were the only MPs in, in Vietnam. That uh, probably a, I cherished that assignment because it was in a combat environment, and my soldiers were draftees. I later commanded a battalion of volunteers in Germany, and a brigade of volunteers in Germany in the 80s, the late 70s, and early 80s. I'll take that company of draftees any day. They were wonderful citizens. What made them so good? Their nation called, and they, they came from every walk of life. You know, I had PhDs and guys that never graduated high school. And they, they meshed. They, they had a sense of urgency about, in 1965, uh, the Viet Cong were on the run. Uh, I left in 66, we could have declared a military victory and come home. But they were they were focused. They were dedicated. They were they were mission oriented, and they served their country for two years and, and got on with their lives. And the second tour, 1970 71 was totally different. Uh, it was towards the end of the conflict, and it was like a bunch of rats fleeing a sinking ship. Nobody wanted to be the last one out. It was very difficult. As a I was a battalion executive officer for six months and then went to the Division Provo Marshal Office in the AmeriCal Division. Uh, I'd, I would rather not talk about that. Fine. Um, well, let's lighten the mood because the story you were telling us uh, just before we started taping is that you were at a, a USO show starring the great Bob Hope and uh, yeah. something very special happened. Yes, uh, my dad was the technical director of the Bob Hope Show on NBC television and Mr. Hope comes to Vietnam every year and uh, this was December of 1970, and one of Dad's engineers accompanied Mr. Hope on the tour. My father said, if you can't get my son to say hi to Bob Hope, don't bother coming back. So I, a helicopter landed on our fire base, and uh, they took me over to Freedom Hill in Da Nang to, to the Bob Hope show, and took me up on the stage to say hi to Bob. And he puts his arm over my shoulder and says, boy, you've grown since I saw you last. <laughs> We were just making small talk about, uh, he, my dad used to bring Bob Hope and Les Brown out to the house for dinner because my mom was a great cook and this got them out of the hotel and out of the, you know, the commercial eateries. Uh -huh. And we were just recounting those things. It was, it was very, very nice. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. He was a, a genuine, real, honest to God person. Just, there was nothing fake about him at all. What did that do to lift your spirits on that tough tour? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Martha Ray was also another one of the great giants. I have bumped into her twice. She, in 1965, she went down to Canto in the Mekong Delta to get to dedicate a brand new Esther Williams swimming pool that the special forces had arranged to be brought in, this fiberglass swimming pool. <laughs> Uh, they threw her in the water. <laughs> I happened to see that. So in 1970, she helicopters into my fire base. She gets off the helicopter, and she's now a lieutenant colonel, and I'm a major. So I salute her, and I said, ma'am, it's good to see you again. She said, when did we meet before? And so I started to explain. She said, oh, my God, you were there when that happened. <laughs> she, you know what that woman did? God love her. She was a registered nurse. And she was an officer in the Army Nurse Corps, reservist. Mm -hmm. And she would do these USO tours and volunteer to stay in Vietnam for 89 days to work in hospitals. Okay. Yes, sir. And she did that multiple times. She is buried in the Special Forces Cemetery at Fort Bragg. And well-deserved. Oh, absolutely. Boy, that, 
you think about the, how important that was to a lot of different celebrities back then. Really oh, uh, the, the story, I could tell you stories till the cows come home. Uh, in, that, in that era, we had people from Hollywood that were marvelous. They came over on a regular basis. Those are just two examples. Any others that stand out immediately? Yes, but I can't remember her name. She was a, <laughs> she was a, a Hollywood darling, and she's now in her, in her late 70s and still oohs and ahs over her experiences in Vietnam. I'll probably remember her name when we're finished. <laughs> so after Vietnam, what, what, where'd you go then in your career? Uh, be, between tours in Vietnam, the Army sent me to graduate school to go teach at West Point, and I taught up at West Point in the Department of Social Sciences for a couple of years. Uh, had a tour in the Pentagon after Vietnam in, in Deputy Chief Staff Operations. Went to command a battalion in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, came back to the Army War College. Returned to Stuttgart on the, on the, as the G5 of the 7th Corps Staff. And then activated to command of the MP Brigade in 7th Corps. Uh, from there I came back uh, as an Army Fellow at the Army War College to do research papers and write speeches for the Army Chief of Staff. Uh, wound up uh, taking uh, elements of the 7th Special Forces Group to Grenada in 1983-84. Uh, went on the Joint Staff in J-5 for three years. Went over to National Defense University from my last year of active duty and retired in 1988. Started my own business in, um, in marketing, uh, unrelated to the Defense Department and then uh, retired from that and moved to North Carolina and have enjoyed retirement ever since. Happily ever after. Absolutely. What are you most proud of when you think about your service to our country? Well, it's 30 years of... I was very, I was very fortunate to be a commander uh, from platoon level to brigade and the opportunity to, to lead soldiers is the thing I'm personally proudest of. Uh, wonderful American soldiers. They're just, you know, men, women. Uh, the opportunity to serve my country, I'm, I'm deeply patriotic. Uh, I have seen the rest of the world, and I've seen the bad parts of the world. I've seen communism. It does not work. I've seen what people will do to be free. To see 77-year-old women hanging off the bed sheets from the seventh floor apartment in the Bernauerstrasse in Berlin to become free and dropping into a, a fire net, fireman's net. Uh, that, that really, really impacts you. And we in this country take that for granted. And it, it's not free, you've got to fight for it. And I think that's what we in the uniformed services, that's one of our missions, is to, to make sure that we always keep this country free. But we've got to make sure that our people understand that there's a price to be paid for that. When we had a draft, which we no longer have, most American men got drafted or were eligible for the draft. They found out very quickly. And I wish we could have some form of national service for our young people. Not necessarily the military, but kind of a give back for a couple of years. We have, we. Have, we have so much in this country we take for granted. Uh, so yeah, that's what I'm proudest of, the, the, the opportunity I had to lead soldiers. Well, Mr. Pike, we thank you so much for your service to our country over thank you. several decades, and we thank you very much for your time with us today. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Appreciate it very much. U.S. Army veteran Vern Pike served during the Cold War, served during Vietnam, and uh, joining us today on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles.